Could you um, tell me your name and your address? I'm A.J. Whittenberry, 6th and Anderson Street, Greenville, South Carolina, 29601. Thank you. So could you tell me about 1933, that time that Mr. Neely wrote this letter? Could you tell me, could you tell me about the, the, the black workers who worked in the cotton mills here? Uh, Black workers were only employed as yard workers, not inside the mill, because at that time they established a law that a Negro and white could not look out the same window, and windows were in the mills. They could not, at that time, they could not end of the meal in the same door. The Negro were entered at the back, white entered at the front. And they always kept them separated. They never came in contact with each other. The securing the Negro to work in the yard, work in the yard only. So they truck cotton? Yes, ma'am. I'm sure they worked with some of the white people in some way, don't you think? No, ma'am. Nothing but the supervisor out there with the yard. That's the only way. I have seen these things happen. You never worked in the mill yourself? No. Yes, ma'am. I worked it one time. But I worked as a, at that time, I worked as a, a what they call clean up. Did not let me operate a machine. But only I could clean up in the mill. I had to keep a Keep in motion going around, not to stop and talk to in the employees. Which mill did you work at? Union Breacher. I didn't work there too long. I worked there because I had to, at that time, they uh, was uh, recruiting people, persons for World War II. And if you worked on a job in the mill or something, you was uh, w wouldn't be recruited quite as quick. Okay. Now, Mr. Neely wrote this letter in 1933. That was many years before World War II. Oh, yeah. Um, that's the war you're talking about, right? That's right. You're not talking about World War I? No. Okay. Talking about World, World War II. Okay, now, in Greenville, could you describe, I mean, was there a community of people who were concerned about the working conditions of black men? I mean, was that what Mr. Neely was a part yeah. of? Well, you had a few would come out and say, none were concerned, but they were afraid to say anything because they knew at that time if they would say something that they wouldn't like too well, they'd be ready to exclude you in some way, shape, form, not fashion. And they had several ways they could, could get a Negro man. First thing, They would uh, search his records to see whether or not he had any kind of record whatsoever, bad record whatsoever. This is even back in 1933? Yes, ma'am. And if he had a bad record, he was out all together. 
and if he had a good record, they would find something and put something on him if he talked too much. For an instance, uh, at one time, Mr. G Jim Brown, who was the president of the branch at that time, when, when it was organized, went up on Main Street and began to tell people about the importance of voting. They wanted to do away with him, kill him. He was saved by another Negro undertaker. <laughs> and Mr. Mr. Neely, as I told you before, was outspoken. And they attempted to get rid of him, but they wanted the sympathizers to do that. So they knew that Mr. Tolliver was sympathized with good treatment of Negroes. And so the Ku Klux got him and carried him and put him on Mr. Tolliver's porch and stripped him of his clothes. And they were thinking that uh, Mr. Talbot at this time would come out and kill him. Mr. Talbot wasn't at home at this time. His wife looked at that and saw and knew him. And she went back in the house and got Mr. Talbot's overcoat and put it on him and called a taxi and paid his way home. Now, at this period of time in 1933, it's when the NRA was just coming into yeah. effect. Do you remember the National yeah, yes, Recovery Act? Could you tell me what you thought about it at the time, how people felt, about, how the black people felt about it? We felt good about it because we felt as if the president of the United States looking out for the poor and the Negro. But nevertheless, the meal real executives thought it was was meddling in the business too much. See, at that time, years ago, you could not live in a Greenville but one way without coming through a mill village. that you come with the lost road that be on the way. Ponset Highway, Relevant Road, Augusta Street, all there you have to come by a cotton mill. It was surrounded by cotton mills. And so cotton mill business was the biggest business in that day. And so, if if NRA, NRA, NRA were to come in, they felt that they were meddling, the government was meddling with their biggest business. This town at that time was called the textile of the world, Greenville. You find their records. And so it was quite interesting. All the people, number I said, number of the executives were big people, lives in Greenville and around Greenville. And they depended on the mills so they could make their million dollars. And so therefore, my father told me, said there are two things 
a southern white man will take notice of. If a Negro meddle with the women, that's number one. Number two, mess with his dog. See, these two things would get a southern white man up. So, at this time, NRA was meddling with his dollar, wasn't it? So he became concerned when I fought. Now, do you, do you know what Mr. Neely was specifically writing about? Yes, ma'am. He was writing, writing about the welfare of the Negro. Because at that time, we were, were living on small amount of money. No saving, couldn't save. Hand to mouth. That's right, that's all, that's all. <laughs> that's what he, so therefore, that was the greatest concern, economic. Economic of the Negro. Now, I have a question. M Mr. Neely said it. I'm going to repeat it, and then I want you to put it in your own words, okay? Oh, yeah. Mr. Neely said that the cotton mill industry was a white industry, that most of the workers were white, and only a handful were black. But yet, he was concerned enough about this new legislation he wanted it to include the black workers. And now it wasn't going to include lots and lots of black people because they only made up a small part of the industry. Ten percent. Ten percent of population. Five percent. He said that five oh, yeah. percent of the industry was black and 95 percent was white. Oh, yeah. But he was still concerned about it, that five percent, that that five percent should be included in this new textile code. Yeah. Why? He was speaking from a code standpoint. Okay, so tell me about that. Code. Roy Wilkins told us about code. 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 He said, we work on code now. After we get code, let's forget it and let people get themselves prepared. You understand what I'm talking about? No. Well, in other words, well, I, I, whenever they hire 100 people, employees, mm -hmm. out of this 100, they should hire 10 Negroes of colder population okay. at I mean, that time. I don't think that's what he was saying. I mean, you're right. I it, think what you're saying is right, but I think what he meant in this letter was... There was this part of that new law, the NRA. Um, uh, we weren't talking with him about this, but he may have been talking with some of uh, all of once. Okay. Mr. Walker and Mr. Brow and Mr. Arnold and all that. But do you? you but were, they wouldn't let us in. Wouldn't let us. We were too young. They wouldn't let us. <laughs> <laughs> now, but do, would you say that you remember this period of time? I mean, would you? Could you say? With conviction, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you remember this period of time when they were putting the NRA in and these cotton coats? Yes, ma'am. I remember all of that. And, yeah. and uh, that was the year... 1933. Under, uh, uh, under President Roosevelt. Right, first year under President Roosevelt. And I heard him speak. He came through talking about these things. That... Uh, I went to Southern Station. He was on the train, come from Warm Spring, Florida, going back to Washington. And the line was, I mean, the people were crowded down to see. Yeah. 
one friend God. And uh, so he was speaking concerning these of the NRA at that time. Now, did, did, do you know if the NRA, if the, if the Negroes were included in this, were they ultimately included? No, ma'am, they weren't included because uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the Negroes in the yard at Sentinelville, I can, didn't have any insurance. But the people in the mill, they worked in the mill, did have insurance. That was later. That was in '41. Yeah. But I agree with you. Yeah. Now, do, was so was there a group of would you say intellect black intellectuals who were living here in 1933 who were talking about these issues? Yeah. Uh, and maybe intellectuals the wrong. Term. They were some. They were some people were talking it behind closed doors. Okay, but they were aware. Oh, yes, ma'am. And were they receiving communication of some sort? even indirectly from the NAACP in New York? I mean, did they hear about what was going on with the NAACP in other places? Yeah. Uh, there were several people here. I can give you names of people and, uh, and uh, that would get the message. And, uh, but they openly, they didn't say anything about it. Might put Mr. Neely. He's the only person. Mr. Neely signed his name. Yes, that's right. He was the only person. Because some of them were in businesses. And uh, some of them had good jobs. What did what? Now, did Mr. Well, what did Mr. Neely do? This organization, it says the National Council of World War Veterans. Was Mr. Neely in World War One? In World War One. Okay. What did he do for a living? Do you remember? What was Mr. Neely's occupation? I can't remember exactly what his occupation was. But I do know he had several. Was he a carpenter? I think he was, was a, carpenter. a carpenter. His nephew's a carpenter. Yeah. James Neely. Yeah, that's right. He built. He's the one that um, started Mountain View Church. Oh, uh, oh yeah, and uh, but I do know there's several fellows, several people he was talking with. I know, okay. but. Now, do you think that, um, like, I got this letter here. There's another letter that I found from the NAACP in High Point, North Carolina. Mr. Neely's letter is written July 12, 1933, and the NAACP in High Point wrote there, sent a post, sent a telegram July 25, 1933, and they said, on behalf of High Point NAACP, I urge you, sir, each industrial code be carefully scrutinized to prevent exclusion of or discrimination against Negro, that every step be taken to assure Negroes their full share jobs without discrimination. Oh, yeah. And then there was a letter here from the, the NAACP, you have it in your hand, from oh, yeah. Mr. Roy Wilkins. Yes, right. And he wrote his August 15th, 1933. And Mr. Neely was ahead of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was a little ahead of he, he and he says again that he says, and I uh, hear. Because a number. Could you tell me that in my in your own words? Yeah, a number of families depended on that supposed to have been a good job in that day for the Negro, and a lot of communities depended on that. And if if they get more money or more benefits, they felt if the community would be benefited from that. Their families be benefited. So therefore, we were concerned about that. They could not do that with the people raising, raising crops. 
because if uh, cotton prices were the same, if you had one bale of cotton, if you had 50 bales of cotton, it was the same price per pound. So they couldn't do anything with that, but they could do something with the employment at the mill. Because I remember once, just kind of outside, my father went to hear President Nominee to make his speech at Sentinelville. Or he was talking about the, at that time, they would, uh, in the spring of the year, whenever they attempt to borrow money, the price of cotton was up. Maybe 15 or 18 cents per pound. But in the fall, whenever they go to pick the cotton, the price of cotton was five and six and seven cents a pound. What happened was that the big man at the fertilizer mill would, he was the one getting the benefit of the doubt because he had mortgage over the crop, you see. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, maybe, oh, so maybe, loud. yeah. Maybe one or two bales, three bales would pay, a uh, five bale would pay for the fertilizer in the spring of the year. But when the fall of the year come, it'll be 10 or 15 bales of cotton. Close the door all the way. That's gonna be hot though. It's too hot. It'll be too hot. Oh yeah. Let me ask you a question. Can you, did, did you ever see the stationery before? Did he? No, ma'am. He I never, never did. Never the same. Okay. Do you think he typed this himself? Who's that? Mr. Neely. No, he he must have had somebody else to do it. You for. think so? Yeah. Could you read that first part? Is it can you, is that hard to read, or can you read that? Dip you. Well, T H E Y T H E Y. Will they be any workers for color people in South Carolina on the new wage scale in the South? I noticed in the newspaper that cleaning and outside help is not considered. Less the code of meals. John Johnson, you know, I am in the South, especially South Car. Ninety five percent of the meal work, meal labors is white. And you see why they co-labor You see why with that put in the cord, cleaners and outside helpers that would apply to colored labors. So I hope that you will not accept all of the cord till some provision is made to raise colored people's wages in South Carolina, which it will never be unless you take it in hand. You know in South Carolina car, a colored man have got no job if a white man want it. He didn't type that. He wasn't he didn't have that much education. He got somebody else to type it. But he said it. Yeah, he said it. 
Yeah. He cuts them. Because he, he can type. He had heart. Oh, yeah. Do you remember when the white, when, when the people in Greenville started organizing unions? The textile workers. I don't know what year. It was in 1933. I, oh, yeah. And they, at that time, they would not allow Negroes be in the Union. Right. That's right. I remember that. I feel like I'm at church. I, <laughs> well, air conditioned church. Oh, <laughs> listen, um, what was I going to ask you? Right. They didn't allow the, 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 the black men to be in the union. No. Do, do you... So do you, But do you recall them? Do you, do you recall hearing about or seeing the white textile workers yes, organizing? Ma yes, ma'am. Could you tell me about that? This yes, is the night, same time, 1933. Oh, yeah. Well, at this time... Uh, we were having meetings concerning of this. I remember one night we having a meeting, had a meeting at the, on the other street. Some synthetic white was in it. And that night, we heard something in the house under the building, you know who we were? Some white was there trying to eavesdrop what was saying, being said. In Greenville, on Earl Street, <coughs> East Earl Street. And uh, this had something to do with the unions? Yes, ma'am. They were talking at that time. We were talking at that time about Negroes being excluded, would not be accepting unions. Do you remember, was that during the war? Was it World War II that that was going on, um, or was it earlier? No. This when we was talking, this was after World War II. Okay. okay. Now, do you remember in 1934, okay, September 1934, there was a big general textile strike? And the textile workers all over the country went out on strike. Yeah. Yes, the one meal at Pelzer never did over no more after strike. What did they do? One meal yeah. of sobbed in Pelzer, South Carolina. That's about, what, 18 miles? 18 miles. South in this track. Do you remember seeing the people on the picket line or the National Guard coming in with their guns? No, I didn't see that. Did, but I heard about it. You did? Heard about it. Do you remember hearing about seven men in Honeypath, South Carolina, getting murdered and shot? They were out on the picket line. Oh, yeah. That's right. I heard about that. That was uh, that was the same time when one meal in, they had a time, had some affairs, have down at Pels too. Because there was a group, they wanted to go to work. Another group didn't want to work. So they got against each other. And if you cross the picket line, they wouldn't let nobody cross the picket line. That's right. Now, you, but you don't, re do you, you don't remember seeing this? No, ma'am. I didn't see it. Wait, what well, were I, you? I didn't, see, I, didn't see, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I stayed away from it. You didn't go they, didn't, they didn't allow us. No nigga to be around there, no way. You better not be around there. You don't want to be around strikes? 
Well, they wouldn't allow you then to get rid of it. No, oh, man. Didn't bother anything about those tracks. You take Negroes in general didn't bother anything about it because, <laughs> well, nevertheless, they will ask you right quick, you don't have nothing to do with it. Not to... Even, the, even the ones that worked in the yard, the Negroes working in the yard, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. So if there was a strike for 21 days, where did all the black workers go? What? Pardon me? If there was a strike and they shut the plant down for three weeks, like they did in September 1934, where did all the black workers go? Oh, where they go? Went home, stayed home until they were called back to work. The wives worked. Yeah. Or they... St in homes. Yeah. Did you know... Black women who worked in the homes of mill workers? Yes, ma'am. Put in there. That bus would be, there's a trolley at that time. It would be full of them going to work early in the morning. But those mill workers didn't have much money. They didn't get paid much, did they? No, ma'am. Sure, if some of them got, some of them got three and four dollars a week. So the, 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 so a lot of the black women took care of oh, yeah. regular mill workers, not, yeah. not up class, not management, but regular mill workers. Yes, ma'am. Because if a man worked in the mill and his wife worked there, See, they had to have somebody to take care of the children. So whenever they come home, the persons that work for them, the woman that work for them, could go home. Now, is it true, and even in Greenville, that I say I don't say all mill workers. I say some of them, when the man and wife both working in the mill. It must have been somewhat strange in a way because I heard that the white mill workers were really looked down upon. Well, Is that true? Yes, ma'am. How were they looked at? How were, where were they? In were society. They, in how, what did society think of them? Society didn't think much of them. That's why they built mill villages. And there, everyone that worked in the mill lived on the mill village. That's what they call the mill village. <laughs> and uh, how did um, how were they treated in town? Or. Uh how did people think about them? They were treated better than the Negroes. They were treated like the high class society people, but they were treated better than the Negroes because you could go to a store years ago if a crowd of people in there waiting Usually they get the rich ones first. Then they get the workers and meal workers next. Then in time, then they wait on the Negroes if they, if they wait. No matter what time you went there, you, you would be in front. But they pass you by and get someone else. 
Did the mill workers know that they were looked down upon? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am knew it. <laughs> it must have been, um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not naive. I know a lot of these answers, but I, I also know it must have been a very complex thing because the, uh, the only thing that kept the white mill workers, it wasn't much keeping the white mill workers on top, was it? I mean, they were really holding on by their fingernails, weren't they? Oh, yeah. And they knew that. Yeah. Well, at that time, they had three different education systems here in Greenville. Yes, ma'am. The top white went to Greenville High. The mill workers in the pole in certain categories went to Parker. Negroes went to Sterling. Hospital was the same way. The high, high class, what they call white, J. Marion Sims. The working white went to Greenville Gym. The Negro went to Blue, call it Blue Hospital. The schools and the hospital had three different systems. And how much control did the, uh, did the mill executives have in the county or in the city or even in the state? Well, as far as the executives, the they have that the, today. For the text in South Carolina. In South, Ca industry. in South Carolina. If the mill, if the big executives of the mill were to come to South Carolina today, and in manufacturing. They would excuse, school them from tax paying for a number of years. Now, That's how much power they have. Now, could you tell me about the kind of power that the mill management or the textile industry had in the 1930s? 1930s, the textile in Greenwood was the boss with the top. And I, I could say this much, if it weren't in that day, if it wasn't for the textile, there wouldn't be no Greenville. Today. Wouldn't have been no Greenville at that time. We will build up on meals. And what about the state, South Carolina? Same? Yeah. Almost some parts of the state. And the Piedmont region as a whole? Yes. Well, the biggest thing was in the state, in the Piedmont area, was cotton meals. I know that. So how do you think these mill executives and the mill industry felt when hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cotton mill workers, white cotton mill workers for the most part, organized unions in 1933 and 34? They didn't want it. A number of mills came to South Carolina and the southern states because didn't have to be organized. They having problem now about the BMW. Yes, sir. 
BMW right now. Did you know what South Carolina offer BMW? What? Number of years without paying tax and all of that. How do you think, were you sympathetic? Did you want to see the, co the, the cotton mill workers? I know that they were giving the black people a hard time, the workers. I know that, that. but even so, did you and your friends feel sympathetic when they were trying to organize unions? Did you see that as an important step in the 1930s? As long as it was excluding the Negro, no. Wasn't a good step. Looked like it's getting from the situation we was about to get to. Did you feel like when the NRA and those new laws were coming in that it was gonna that it was opening up for everybody for yes, a while? Yes, yes, ma'am. I felt as so. So that would you say the NRA represented something for all working people? Yes, that's right. And uh, you see, in that day, if I was qualified to do certain things, I'm going to tell you how far it got. It, it got in the far as South Carolina, it was in government jobs. When they opened the air base, Greenwell Army Air Base, I went down there to apply for a job. You know what they gave me? A broom. And I was a certified mechanic. Did you know what they had? Hired some, some other races down there, female, to know a 916 from a screwdriver as a mechanic. I stayed there about two or three days. You know what I did? Walked off. Is that when you opened up your own shop? That's right. <laughs> you showed that. <laughs> sure did. And my brother had finished college. You know what they wanted him to do? Be a janitor. See, some of South Carolina stuff. Yeah, and I heard about Mr. Walker. He'd been a principal in the black school. Yes, right. And then, then they integrated. That's right. And then what happened to him? I really don't know. Those fellows wouldn't talk too much. I don't know what happened to him. Well, I guess from what I heard tonight, they handed him a broom in the integrated school. He went from being a principal yeah. to a janitor. I don't know. He he came down as a head of the custodians. Oh, uh, well, had been a many of my coat, certain thing. I remember years ago when I was president, we told me things. that they were afraid to become members of the NAACP. And I remember we lived on down my street in the principal going with Sterling High School would slip down at night and come down to the house and give me some money and tell, say, enormous, don't tell where he got it from. You know that's something. It 
and, and all these things. I have lost a lot of money. You know what? Mr. Thomas Self Hell stood up and gave away money. Why? Because churches would send the NWC P money. And whoever bring it would come with a check. And when we get the check, we would put in the, I mean uh, deposit it and come and find out the check wasn't no good. And spent the money. To keep the branch alive, people, I thought we had such such amount of money. And he and myself would get together and get that amount of money. Put it back. You gave it, you sacrificed a lot, didn't you? <laughs> I don't know why I did that. I don't think he told. He, we always kept a secret. You knew this guy, didn't you? No, I didn't know all of it. <laughs> no, no, we wouldn't tell because we didn't want to get out. We didn't want to get out because NWCP was trashes. Did you know I was running a service station here? Garage, I had a garage built in the back. And they said they were going to blow up the service station and my house. She knew it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we, the March on Washington in 63, Going to get that badge. Grimmel News have tried to buy that badge from me. I kept it. I kept it. <laughs> I concerned. Oh. Oh. A man supposed to, to kill me? You know who saved my life? A little girl, nine years old. You say, why? The, how did she, she save his life? That That's a badge right there. That's our delegate to the... Emancipation March, August 28, 1963 in Washington. Gives me the chills in the back of my spine. <laughs> All right, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened that night before it. When we got ready, we were going to get a bus. i tell you the whole story. But top and self, they put in our hands to secure a bus instead of going up in cars. So we uh, went and got Lanny Greyhound. Lanny Greyhound heard about it. They wouldn't. Send that bus, cancel that. So we went to over here at Liberty. A man didn't know anything about it, had a bus, rented his bus, got him the cab. <laughs> he didn't know it until we got almost in, in Washington. <laughs> and so uh, when we left, Reverend Golden Bolden gave prayer. And did you know the Ku Klux Klan said they were going to blow that bus up? Officers followed us from Greenville to Charlotte. And that particular night, this place supposed to have been blown up in my house. That's why I kept going back <laughs> to see what was going on. And when we got in Washington, see things good come out. As we were going down the street, Mr. Larry Brockman, he was tall, 
much of a man had the banner, Greenville. A white girl and a white boy came off the sidewalk, came down there. See, from Greenville, South Carolina, I said, yes. He said, oh, my people live on Alton Avenue. That was about two blocks from where I live. He said, can we carry the flag? Can we carry the banner? He said, those people down there, those people should learn some sense. That everybody is somebody. It's white. Did you let him carry the banner? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They wanted. <laughs> Did you take a picture that day? No, ma'am. No. That's the first time I ever gone to a fair where Negroes and white and everybody, all night and night, sat down and ate together. You know what Roy Wilkins said that day? Said, you all have met this. This, this is the top. This is the top of the situation. When you go back home, do that which is right. So, this branch kept on working. Kept on working. La. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. There's been, since then, in the last few years, there's much came to me. One Sunday I went to Pencil Street Baptist Church. It used to be an all white church. And I went there that Sunday and I was going to leave out. And so someone came, say, you stay here. People want to shake your hands. As I stood there, people lined it up, shaking my hands. I noticed a, a lady had a daughter. She, every time somebody come up in the line, she let them get in front of her. I wonder what's going on. And after everybody, after all they shaking my hand and got down to her, that lady said, that's Mr. Wittenberg. That's a man. Her daughter, about nine years old, said, I read a lot about you. I'm glad to see you today in person. That's why I said, see some people got, oh, all white people bad, this and that, no. I don't, I never have been that way. When my, when our daughter went to school, she brought back with her two white girls to spend the weekend. You know why I told them? Make yourself at home. I've never looked at color of skin. Let's forget that. How did that little nine-year-old save your life? Pardon me. The nine-year-old girl. Yes, right. How did she save your life? 
Oh, yeah, I didn't tell you about that. No. Says husband belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. And so he was telling his wife at the breakfast table about what he, you know, where they do a job, get a job done. Whoever pulled a short straw will do the job. See, the straw, straws is put up on the object. You don't know what, you can't tell every straw come out about the same distance. You can tell what the short straw or not because they won't let you remove the object. That night, he said he pulled a short straw. Went home and told his wife about what he's supposed to do. The little girl heard it. You know what his good little girl said? His daughter said, he said, Daddy, said he loved his daughter like you love me. Said, went to his heart. Went back to the clan meeting, told me he couldn't do the job, told him what to happen. You know what they did? Turned his car over, took his job, he worked in the mill. Then he began to sell socks. I got one of the socks that he sold me yet. Kept it. I bought socks from him. Give him other places he go sell socks. Well, the station's right up the street. <laughs> Station. Oh, the police station. Wait, now, how did you find out about what the little girl told her daddy? Who told you? He, he told me. He told me himself. Came right here in this place and told me. I was running a service station here. Came here and told me. That's right. That's why they pulled a straw. Who was going to shoot you? What's that? That's why they grew the straw. Oh, yeah. Who gonna do the job? <laughs> What's his name? Is he still living, this man? I, I don't know. I haven't heard from him lately. For years. That's a beautiful story. That's some story. He was a mill worker? Yes, ma'am. Which mill did he work at? I, don't, I can't remember now which mill he worked at, but nevertheless. Wow. They say God will take care of you. That's what the scriptures say. We came here one night. We had gone to Bible class, and one was broke in the back door was lying on the bed in the middle of the room there oh, with the telephone on. A Ku Klux Klan? No, I don't think he belonged to Ku Klux Klan. There's some of these dope fellas or something, some years ago. Oh. How many years ago has that been? About three or four years? Yeah. I called the police. Two was at the front door, in less than five minutes. Two at the back door. And two came in the house, searching the house. He was asleep on your bed? Yeah. Thank God he was asleep. He broke in. It was two bottles. Jesus, they were both sleeping on the no, bed? No, the other one had gone. Gone. I think he must have gone to get a truck or something to hold the stuff out. Oh. Lord. God was looking out for you, Mr. and Mrs. Wimberg. God look out for everybody. Ooh. He looked for everybody. Now, what, you know, where did you get this name Wittenberg from? It sounds Jewish. My father. My father. It's German. It's German? Yeah, yeah. came from Gaffney. Gaffney, South Carolina. Yeah, Gaffney, South Carolina. Sounds Gaffney. Jewish to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is Jewish? <laughs> yes, ma'am. German. 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 All right. All right, as long as it's none of my kinfolk. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well. Oh, wow. 
you are precious people, both of you. I am so grateful to get to listen to you. And um, I'm going to give this tape to uh, an archive here in Greenville when I'm done with it. Ah, stop. Um, I'm going to give this tape maybe to the NAACP or somebody who should have these stories, okay? Yeah, right. And if you'd like, I can make a copy for your daughter. Okay. Okay, she'd like that. Yeah. I'm sure lots of people have recorded with you before, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. Hundreds of them, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure none of these stories are new. Yeah. Now, one last thing. Um, huh. Do you think there's a picture of Mr. Neely somewhere? You think that wouldn't be too hard to get? Let me see. His daughter. His son. Son. Miss Neely, the one was over here yesterday. Married his son. They may have a picture. His, of him. Is his son living? Yeah. His son is living or his nephew? His son is living. Miss Neely's husband is Miss Ayrod's son. Son. I didn't know that until yesterday. What's I didn't know it. What's his what? name? James? Oh, well, 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 don't get up. Get the telephone director. I can find out. Get the telephone director. We can find out. So, so you definitely knew. You, me. I could call her and ask her. Yeah. I could oh. call her. Would you do that? Is it uh, not too late? No, it's okay. not too late. No, we. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's in our Bible class. She's over here last night. How old is she? Miss Needless. Miss Neely's in her 60s, I know. Okay. Now, so you knew him in 1933 for yeah. sure. Yes, ma'am. I could show you the house where he lived in. Right at the back of Old and Star Line School. Do you, do you think Mr. Neely was talking to... Did he know people who were working in the mill then? Do you think Mr. Neely knew he may, black mill workers? He may know. Let me see, who else would know? I mean, I'm just wondering if Mr. Neely had friends who worked oh. in the mill, you think? His son? No, 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 this is Elrod. No, ma'am, no, ma'am. Do, no, ma no, do you think he was friendly with black mill workers who worked in the mill? Did they well, go to his church? He well, was, he was friendly with society. I said it that way. But I know they couldn't hire him in the mill because he was a carpenter, I believe. Wasn't he a carpenter or something? His was a trade. And, uh, but he was friendly to society. Yeah. Friendly to and society. And do you think that he knew that Roy Wilkins from the NAACP was writing letters like this too? Do you think that he had some idea about that? Well, I don't know. I couldn't say whether or not that he had an idea. But do you he, think he, he wrote was, this as a complete individual, or he was talking to other people? He knew that other people were thinking about these things? Yes, ma'am. I think he, he was concerned with uh, that was more than he. But he was the one, the guinea pig we call he was the guinea pig. He, he was he was he was anxious to let it be known. He didn't mind letting his name be known. Do you think he knew that the black? Do you think he did it because he thought maybe black textile workers wouldn't do it on their own? That's right. They wouldn't do it because I tell you something. Else, the teachers would not come together and file for an income. The NAACP had to do it themselves. <laughs> South Carolina used to pay white teachers so much, maybe pay a white teacher hundred dollars in a month. Negro teachers pay them fifty and sixty dollars a month. If Greenville was such a big textile town, then when then this strike come to South Carolina, 
It must have been something that you knew about. Oh, yeah. This big strike was huge. Oh, yeah. I knew about all this strike, but I wouldn't have anything to do with it. Because they kept us uh, being involved whatsoever in the beginning. <laughs> so. Now, I found a list of black locals, of unions for, tech, for union locals, for black textile workers in Macon, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Spartanburg, Gaffney, Packlet, South Carolina, Pelzer, South Carolina. What do you think about that? Do you think that there could have been black local unions that some black textile workers would have tried to join unions at that time? Yeah. Uh, you know, the man that organized the march in Washington, what was his name? He belonged to a Negro union, Porters. They had a union, train porters. And, uh, and uh, unions back then, some of the unions didn't consider but one race at the time. But I have a number here that you probably could call and get uh, this lady has. She think this lady has air guard knees. Picture. Picture. And, and, and that was that her, his daughter-in-law? No, that's um, L. Rod Neely's nephews. Nephews. James, right? James was his nephew? No, I don't know if that's his name or not. I, she called him something else. You can take that number down because I got some more numbers on me. You do, okay. Nothing on here. Okay, we can have that. Her name is Daisy. Daisy. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. She worked for $9 a week and 40, 40 hours a week. They thought they should be getting twelve dollars. And your wife is holding another one that was written by workers in Coolamy, North Carolina. Did they work? Oh, they didn't keep up with the hours. They had worked no, they, they, the sun up. Well, the, all the other, the, all the people under the code were supposed to work eight hours a day. Oh, but man. if they didn't have to put the outside workers on the code, then they could work as many hours as they mm -hmm. wanted to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, they signed their names. Oh, yeah. So I have someone in Concord who's been looking for them. Looking for who? These men who signed their names. Oh, okay. Well, that's been so long, they probably did. Well, you're alive. Uh, but, but you didn't work in a cotton mill. <laughs> and they got. The cotton mill. I work in a doctor's office, a clinic. That's the...